where? Hello there. Once again, you decide to take another revealing peek back into history. What famous date shall I set it to today? Once again, it's time for a Throwback Thursday. A second chance to look at some truly awful podcast. No, wait. A second chance to see how far Vices and Teramo has come over the last eight years. New episodes will be released uh, pretty much weekly, but Thursdays I've reserved for throwbacks to see how far we've come. A lot of the information on here no longer applies, whether that be businesses or links that may not work anymore, so be advised of that. But again, I want to thank the patrons that we have at this time, though they may not have been here the first time these episodes were recorded. I am thanking them again because they're helping us move forward with our new episodes. And those are patrons such as at Lonely Bob, Big Al V, and Goldfish. In the meantime, I hope that you enjoy what you hear. <laughs> Welcome to 30 30 Minutes minutes to kill. Kill. Hello everyone, this is Matt from DeadLantern.com's world-famous Splattercast. I'm here to let you know that the third annual Splat Academy Awards are just around the corner, and we invite all of you to participate and help make this the biggest awards show yet. The Splat Academy Awards honor the best films, performers, and moments that the horror genre had to offer in 2009. And once again, we bring together over 20 of the best horror podcasters on the internet to take part in the celebration. Appearing in this year's show in no particular order, Dread Media, Motion Picture Massacre, Zombie Girls, Just Another Meetup Movie Podcast, Horror Etc., Drunken Zombie, 19 Nocturne Boulevard, It Came From the Basement, Midnight Podcast, Mail Order Zombie, The Midnight Horror Show, The Dark Hours Podcast, Horrorphilia, The Sleepy Cast, Slackers Aid My Neighbors, The Movie Cast, The Graveyard Show, Dinner for Fiends, and Night of the Living Podcast, Killer Reviews, Cheap and Dirty Podcast, and Blood Bullets and Bob, The Arrow in the Head Podcast. The awards will take place on March 8th, episode 173 of the Splattercast. But in the meantime, you can get involved by letting your voice be heard. Voting for all categories is open to the public beginning February 1st. You can visit deadlantern.com for an official ballot. Voting ends March 1st, so you should have plenty of time to make those informed decisions that every voter needs. In addition, we invite you to take part in the ceremony itself. We are honored to present Mr. Joe Bob Briggs with a Lifetime Achievement Spooky for his contribution to not only horror, but all of V-Cinema. We will be creating a montage of fan memories, reactions, and thank yous, which will introduce Mr. Briggs before he accepts his award. So tell us why you love Joe Bob Briggs by leaving us a voicemail at 206 206- 350-9636 and be a part of the show. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now, everybody at DeadLantern.com wants to thank the presenters and the fans who always make this Black Academy Award such a fun event. And don't forget to visit DeadLantern.com beginning February 1st for an official ballot and to leave a voicemail for Joe Bob Briggs. Thanks again, and we'll see you on March 8th for the celebration. All right, welcome to Episode 11. We're going to jump right in here in an effort to maybe get the show back to what I originally intended which is simply a 30-minute broadcast where we scratch the surface of a movie. There's a lot of other podcasts out there that do a far better job of breaking down each movie scene by scene and giving you more trivia about it. But my goal is to give you something short, concise, that you can enjoy on a 30-minute commute to work maybe or something of that nature. Let's uh, jump right in with our late to rest segment. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention is I got a email, actually a couple of them, through Facebook from Stanley. 
and Stanley is, uh, he's obviously a little bit behind on the listening to the episodes, but that's absolutely fine. I am going to keep him up there. Like I said, uh, Jason from Horophilia showed me how to shrink my episodes so they fit uh, on there a little bit better. I'm probably going to keep, uh, I'll probably get up to about 15, maybe 15 or 20 episodes, I think, before I'll have to start taking him down. If at any point somebody wants an earlier episode for any reason, which I couldn't really imagine. But, yeah, if they did, if you do, you could contact me, and I would be uh, happy to email that out to you or uh, send it to you through Skype, whatever. I've learned that Skype is a pretty cool way for transferring files, um, large files, actually, movie files and sound files. So that's pretty cool. Anyhow, Stan made a comment, a couple of comments, on the podcast back there at 4, and 4 and 5, I believe. And uh, I'm not actually going to read everything that he said in there simply because uh, he uh, brought up some interesting theories that I'd kind of like to mow over and stuff. But I am, uh, this was pertaining to uh, the questions that I had regarding, you know, glyphs or ruins, uh, keeping spirits at bay and such. You should go back and, and check that out. I don't want to cover it all over again. But Stan sent me a couple of very interesting theories about that. And like I said, I'm going to kind of mull those over myself. But I will definitely put up the link that he sent me that uh, covers string theory and uh, quantum physics. And while I'm, uh, I'm certainly the kind of person that likes to think a lot, uh, I don't necessarily do it well. But anyhow, uh, I'm going to put that up there for you to enjoy. And the videos cover, uh, like I said, they cover the string theory, and they do it in simple words that made it easy for me to understand. So I'm sure my audience will have no problem comprehending. But anyhow, very interesting stuff. So uh, check that out. And again, thank you very much for contacting me, Stan, and leaving me those uh, mails. And let's see, what else did I want to mention? One minor addendum that I had to add to the past episode, episode number 10, was when I mentioned that the song Settin' Here at Midnight was played during Phantasm by Reggie and Jody on the porch in the movie. I mentioned that the composer was actually Bill Thornberry. And then I immediately asked who that was. Uh, well, that was, of course, the actor's real name that played Jody. I am trying to catch any little flubs like that, and we'll probably be editing those out in the future so you don't have to set through those. But I also want to extend a great big thank you to those that are downloading me from outside the country. Um, not to slag anybody here in the U.S. that's listening, new listeners and old that have been with me for a while. I really appreciate those, but it's always exciting and interesting to me to think that this is actually going out to people on the other side of the world. I've got downloads and Ireland, France, Belgium, Germany, Korea, um, and chances are if you're in one of those countries, I'm talking specifically to you because obviously I don't have a huge, a huge download there. So if you're one of the people that did that, thank you again. And again, to the folks in the States, I appreciate you taking your time to actually listen to me. I wasn't sure anybody would. It seems like a few people are, and I do appreciate that. So take a, take a minute and contact me. Uh, I don't have a phone number or anything that you can reach me at, but you can certainly, as always, email me at madsaxon, M-A-D-S-A-X-X-O-N, at yahoo.com, and I'll be happy to read any emails you send me. Welcome to Vices and Teramo, 30 Minutes to Kill. I have a guest host with me here this week to talk about Jeepers Creepers. And our guest host is Jason from Horophilia. Hey, Jason. Howdy ho. How's it going? It's going pretty good. So uh, you got a chance to watch Jeepers Creepers. I know when we had talked about this a while ago, you had said that uh, you remembered not really liking that one too much. You got a chance to watch it again. How are you feeling about it now? Definitely like it better uh, on rewatch. Uh, the first time I saw it was uh, at the theater. So when did that come out? 2001? Yeah, I think so. And I was... I was pretty dis- I just remember coming out re- disappointed that I'd wasted my money. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'd really expecting, but uh, that was my initial thoughts. But I really didn't remember much of it at all, so it was nice to go back and 
and see it. This was before, like I said, uh, I'm a Justin Long fan now, and this was before I even knew who, who he was at all. So Okay. It's pretty cool to go back to that. Definitely. It's uh, it's funny. My wife and I still refer to him as Barry in anything we see him in because this was the role that we kind of first became aware of him in. I'm going to say that when I saw this movie, I probably didn't like it the first two or three times that I saw it, maybe even more. There were a few things that just kind of let me down in the story and it seemed kind of scattered. But setting down last night and re-watching it, uh, at first I couldn't remember what I didn't like about it because there were a lot of things like it kind of getting right into the action to start out with a little bit of dialogue between the brother and sister. Then you kind of jump right into the, the story without a lot of explanation as to what was going on. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is pretty cool. Why didn't it draw me in? Later on, I realized the things that I, I felt were missing. <laughs> but, yeah, it, uh, it seemed to move at a pretty good pace, I thought. I didn't have brothers and sisters that were close in age to me. How about you? No, not at all. My sister's way older than me. Okay. Because I was actually asking my wife and stuff, you know, is that is that dialogue realistic between brothers and sisters? What did you think? Well, she was kind of annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't, the dialogue was... Oh, did I cut out? I, I don't know if the dialogue was uh, realistic or not. I just know that she was... She, her personality in the in the show kind of got on my nerves. I had the I had the same thoughts as you too. The first half of this, I was like, what, "Why did I not like this?" <laughs> I remember liking the you know first part all the way till you know the the big discovery whenever he goes down to the little cave thing. Yeah, I remember I did like that. That's the, one of the few thoughts that I had that I actually remember liking. And yeah, about two thirds of the way through, I was like, "Why did I not like this?" And then. The last third. You're like, oh, yeah, that's why I didn't like this. Exactly. Yeah. Well, with the, uh, as we're going back to the dialogue real quick, it, it actually seemed, with, like I said, without having siblings close to, to my age, it, it did seem somewhat realistic to me in that their conversation would go from just silly goofing off to more serious, um, you know, asking about, well, you know, how have you talked to mom lately and so on, and then back to being stupid again. And I thought, well... For the most part of hanging out with my friends or, you know, close friends and stuff, that's pretty much what I do and stuff. You know, we'll talk about a subject and it'll just kind of go back and forth. But I know later on the dialogue um, in certain parts kind of got, like, uh, I just I don't see them saying this. His uh, very sudden need to to be a hero was kind of the point where the, the movie switched for me. I did really like this, I will say that now. So, looking at it, what I was going to say was I liked the, the subtle start to the movie, that initial part where you've got the, the camper that they've passed that's behind them. And I actually had to rewind it to see exactly at what point that truck showed up. And if you, if you go back and you look at that scene, the truck is actually there behind them the whole time, or at least from the whole time that you have that long shot of them being ahead of the camper because you see the camper turn off and already in the background – you see the truck rearing up on them, and uh, yeah. I thought that was cool. That was uh, something that I liked. How did you feel generally just about the way the whole thing was shot? Uh, yeah, I, as far as the cinematography and the way it shot, I didn't have any problems with that. I thought that was pretty well done, and even the creature design I thought was pretty awesome, too. Yeah. There was uh, another shot that I thought was kind of cool, just the one of her looking down the... Uh, Looking down the pipe, and you see the the church behind her, the steeple, and the cross there in the back. Um, and I thought that was interesting. And so, yeah, the cinematography I thought was pretty cool on this. Um, I guess for those that haven't already seen this, um, you know, I guess maybe a brief synopsis, and this is just off the top of my head here, but a brief synopsis would be a brother and sister are traveling, uh, coming back home from college, and they see, well, first they're nearly run off the road by a large, creepy-looking truck, and um, they later on pass the truck parked at the side of a road near an abandoned church where they see someone, it would appear, uh, throwing something that looked like a body down the side of it, down the tube. And uh, uh, shortly after that, 
they decide to go back, investigate. The brother becomes uh, trapped there and lost there at the bottom of the tube uh, after sliding down there and um, finds a body and finds a crazy, crazy collage of humans. Uh, it looks like uh, tacked to the ceiling uh, of the place, and there's a few.